Hey, you want to say hello to all those online? Welcome. Let's welcome them. I just hope that online that you could get even just a little bit of what we experienced here in the presence of the Lord in the midst of the worship. There was just the sweet presence of the Lord. And if you're here and you didn't experience that, put your hand right here and see if there's a pulse. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Praise God. So good being in the presence of the Lord. I have a message today that's called I'm not what I used to be. Is anybody glad here that you're not what you used to be? (laughs) Let's pray. Father, we come here today and first of all, we just say thank you for drawing us to you. And thank you for transforming us from the person we used to be to what we are and what we're becoming. Lord, as we break open your word today, we pray that the power of the word go forth from this place and transform lives. Lord, I pray that there be a fresh revelation of your word. Grant us fresh enlightenment that we might see what we haven't seen so that we might become what we haven't yet become. Lord, the power of your word is awesome. Wash us in that word today. Empower us in the word Lord, we give you the glory and the praise and the honor for that which we are about to receive in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. I read a survey, actually it was two surveys recently, and it was a little discouraging because in it, it said that over the last decade or so, that it found that most Christians have very little biblical knowledge. We're, we're, we're Christians, but it's more, our understanding of things is more emotional than it is understanding the depth of the Word of God. And that the surveys, these surveys also found that most Christians don't understand or are not aware of Christian doctrines and that most Christians cannot explain to non-believers even basic Christianity. Well, if there's anybody in that category today, I'm gonna make sure that doesn't, that's not the case when you leave here. We're gonna open the Word of God today and find what it says and what it says about us and how we got to be where we are today. To some of you that some of you here today, what I'll cover, you'll say, well, I already, I already know that. Well, but I'm going to help you be able to explain it. Some of you are, are going to say, oh, yeah, now, now I get it, because I've never heard it explained that way before. And then there's others online and here who will say that because of what I heard today, I've been set free because you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Are you ready? Now I'm going to start out a little bit in the negative before I get to the good news. So just bear with me on this. Uh, How many have heard the term cancel culture? Yeah, yeah. It's not good. But we're living in a time of cancel culture. Let me give you a definition of what cancel culture is. Cancel culture is a practice 
in which people are put out of social and professional circles as a way of expressing disapproval and exerting social pressure on them to conform. To conform to what people, certain people, think you should conform to. That's cancel culture. So that today, one has to be careful what they say because they could be canceled, put out of social circles or economic circles or whatever it may be. It could even be a company that has to take a stand. And mo much of this and some of the other theories that are circulating right now are rooted actually in Marxist theory of class struggle where they pit one class against another class, one group against another group, so that in the end, the, the people who are promoting the conflict come out on top. That's what, that's what the class struggle is supposed to achieve. So we're being divided into one class or another, and we also find that increasingly biblical views on societal issues, if we express them, it's considered a negative. It's considered to be offensive if we speak biblical uh, principles in regards to social issues, it's considered to be not politically correct. And we run the risk of being canceled. We also find that in some of these things that are being uh, spoken of today, that we're, we're divided into two camps, the oppressor and the oppressed. The oppressor and the oppressed. And we find in that that um, if you're in the oppressed category, it's said that it comes from your DNA. You can't help yourself. You're an oppressor. It's your nature. And you can't change. I'm about to tell you right now that that's not biblical. <laughs> at all. It's a good thing that Jesus is not about canceling people, but, about, but he's about making them all one in Christ. Now, Jesus did say that <clears throat> there's, there's two categories of people on the earth today. Two categories. The first is the kingdom of God, which Jesus brought with him when he came to earth, and it's been spreading ever since. He's the head of the kingdom of God. The original intent was that when God created the world and the people in it as Adam and Eve populated the earth, all of humanity was to be in the kingdom of God. The whole world was to be in the kingdom of God. Everyone on the earth was to be in the kingdom of God. Satan comes along and he wants to make sure that people who are in this kingdom are drawn out of it and brought into his authority, his kingdom. He's known as the, the God of this world, and that's Satan. God created the world with everybody to be in the kingdom of God. But Satan comes along as a divider. So whenever you see any of this stuff that's being circulated right now, and, and at the heart of it, it actually divides people, you know the source. You know where it comes from. Because Satan is a divider. God created his kingdom and what's in his kingdom. In it, is the power to transform a life. Anybody had a life transformation? In it is peace, joy, love, and an eternal relationship with God, always connected with God. So when Satan created his kingdom, his authority on the earth, to challenge the kingdom of God, 
this kingdom has certain attributes. In it is physical death, spiritual death with eternal separation from God, pain, misery, and sickness. That's all in this kingdom. This is what, this is what was all over the earth and was rarely challenged until Jesus came to earth and brought the kingdom of God. And since then, it's been a clash of two kingdoms. Satan wants you and I permanently canceled out of the kingdom of God because he's a divider. But praise God, God had a plan. Even before Adam and Eve sinned, God had a plan, knowing in advance what was going to happen, had a plan to get people out of this kingdom and into this kingdom. Praise God. Today I want us to see in the Word of God that God is not about canceling but about restoring. God's not about putting people out, but inviting them in. He's not about excluding, but about including. That's the kind of God that we serve. Now, to see how this works, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, because in one little area of Scripture, there is so much. There's doctrine in that. There's such powerful truth in that that I think as we hear this today, not only are we going to get a better understanding of what has happened to us and what is happening, but it's going to set some people free who are still battling issues. Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, which was in Greece, and the Greek culture had strengths and weaknesses like every culture. It, like Rome, began to fall morally before it fell economically and militarily. The church there in Corinth was subject to all the influences of the society that was in. The society it was in was trying to make it conform to it. But we know that the church is not to reflect the society that it's in, but rather it's to be an influence for good, an influence for righteousness, and to point people to Jesus. That's the church. Jesus said in Matthew 28, in the area called the Great Commission, he said, go make disciples of all the nations, teaching them what I've taught you. We are to be influencers not influenced. Are you hearing me today? Unfortunately, too often today, nations are discipling the church instead of the church discipling nations. In his letter to the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul deals with a number of issues that the, the Corinthian church was dealing with. What? A church with issues? Say it isn't so. I shared in the first service, I, over the years I've had people at one time or another say to me, I'm looking for the perfect church. <laughs> and I have responded, well, if you ever find it, when you go there, it won't be perfect anymore. <laughs> and some people have laughed with me and some people have not <laughs> when I've said that. <clears throat> Paul, one of the first issues he was dealing with and he addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 is the fact that some of the Christians there in the church were having disputes between one another and they were taking one another to court. And Paul said to them, you, you have these disputes between you, but rather than having other Christians help you settle them, you take each other to court before judges who are not even Christians. And he reminded them that they're destined to rule and reign when Jesus comes back. We're going to rule and reign with him on the earth. And he's saying, 
and, and now you're telling me there's not anybody in the church who can help you make some decisions in regards to a dispute? There's no one capable of hearing God, has the wisdom of God. You're saying that you can't find anybody in the church. You have to go to Christians or non-Christians and be a terrible witness. Paul was saying, you're called to a higher standard than the world. And, and he was trying to tell them, you need to act like Christians because these kind of actions are, are, are that which is found more here than there. And he saw that this, this whole thing was bringing division within the church. So he admonished them that in situations like this, to, that they were to use biblical principles applied by spiritual people, meaning people who have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them, born-again people. Because it's, they're the only ones who can understand the Bible because the Holy Spirit within them and can apply biblical principles. Paul was saying their, their actions and their attitudes have no place in the kingdom of God. He was calling them to be more like Jesus, to love and pray for those who persecute you, those that wrong you. You need to show grace and mercy, the love of God. And if you can't settle things, just let it go. Then Paul talks about, after that, then Paul begins to talk about in chapter 6 about who and who will not inherit the kingdom of God. Inherit is an interesting word because it's saying when, when you inherit something, somebody must have died. And he's saying somebody did die. His name is Jesus. And there's, there's a tremendous inheritance for the saints. And I don't want you to miss any of it because you're acting more this way than that way. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9, we'll pick it up there. Paul says this, Don't you know that those doing such things, that divisiveness and this, taking each other to court and not forgiving, all those things that you, you've been doing, some of you have been doing, that doing such things have no, people who do this have no share or no inheritance in the kingdom of God. He was saying that, listen, the Word of God is, is, is given as our instructions for life and, and to disavow it or disregard it or has consequences. He goes on to say, don't fool yourselves. Those who live immoral lives, who are idol worshipers, adulterers, or homosexuals, will have no share in his kingdom. Verse 10. Or are thieves, or greedy people, or drunkards, or are abusive, or cheat people. None of these will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, as you hear that list, you may be thinking, wow, whew, I'm glad I'm not on that list. I'm okay, because I'm not included in that. In fact, you may even be saying, yes, yeah, some of those I, I especially disdain and I condemn people for. Well, just when you thought that you were free and clear, <laughs> Paul in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3 adds some more to the category of sins. He adds obscenity, sinful talk, hurtful joking, blasphemy, evil desire, anger, malice, and lying. Are we including any of you yet? <laughs> and if that wasn't enough... He had some more when he was speaking to the Galatian church. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 20 and 21, this is what he adds to that list. Idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outburst of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, which means out of control, destructive behavior, and the like. In other words, he's saying, this is not all inclusive, it's things like this of which I tell you beforehand, I love this part, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in times past. In other words, he's saying, you know, I've told you this before. 
you know, and don't make me have to tell you this again. <laughs> Just as I told you in times past that those who practice such things, practice such things, will not inherit the kingdom of God. So right now, as you've seen that whole list, you may be thinking, I'm never going to make it to heaven. <laughs> Might as well live like a heathen. I've been permanently canceled. But now I want to go to the good news. Thank God there's good news. The first part of this good news is actually found in that scripture in verse 21 of Galatians 5. It said, those who practice such things. Now, I'm not going to cover that right now. I'll get to that later. So, send in your love offering and you can, no. <laughs> you can receive <laughs> tape number 12. No. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6.11 Here's the scripture. This is, this is what attracted me. When I, was, I was reading through this whole area one day. It's like, gosh, there's so much in this one scripture. Here's the doctrine that, that we need to know. Here's the truth that we need to know that will set us free. 1 Corinthians 6, 11. He starts off with, after listing a whole bunch of sins, he says, such were some of you. Hmm. First of all, he's saying, We've all been messed up. How many agree? We're, we're kind of messed up. You know what I'm saying? I mean, there's things. <laughs> and to prove this, let's go over to Ecclesiastes 7.20. says this, Not a single person on earth is always good and never sins. Now, some of you feel better already. <laughs> and Romans 3.23 says, For all, everybody say all. all, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So, there's no room for finger pointing. You know what I'm saying? We're all on the Titanic and it's going down. <laughs> we need a lifeboat. His name is Jesus. But it says, such were some of you. That means, hear me now, that there isn't one category, not one, that you cannot be free from. If you were, that means you're not now. So then we see what changed these Corinthians. And when we see what changed the Corinthians, we can see what can change anybody who comes to Jesus Christ and makes him their Lord and Savior how we can be uncanceled. He starts with, you were washed. You were washed. What does that mean? It speaks of being washed by the blood of Jesus, which, which can cleanse from sin. And in the book of Revelation 1.5, it says this, he washed us, meaning Jesus, from our sins in his own blood. Hebrews 9.22 says, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. To the Jews, when the, when the blood was mentioned, it wasn't just talking about the, the uh, physical blood. It was talking about the, a sacrifice that's been offered and was killed. Its blood was shed till it died. And this is talking about the fact that there, there's a sacrifice for our sin. By the shedding of the blood of Jesus Christ, we can all be cleansed. Isaiah 1.18 says this, Though your sins are as scarlet, they will be, will be, as white as snow. Now, what's the significance of this being wise? Why is this so important? Well, when sin came into the world and mankind was separated from the kingdom of God and brought under the influence and the authority and the role of the God of this world, Satan himself, 
we couldn't get back to here because now there is a wall of separation between us and God. And that wall of separation is sin. It's a barrier. It keeps us from God. You can't get to God and keep this. Are you hearing me today? There has to be a fundamental change, but we can't deal with it on our own. We can't break through on our own. In God's plan, agreed to by the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, even before sin entered the world, God knew what was going to happen, and he made a plan whereby his Son would go to a cross, and that cross would take care of the sin problem. Amen. By this, the barrier is broken, and we have access to the throne of God. But this had to happen, and we had to believe in what happened here. We had to embrace the cross in order to get out of this kingdom, out of, un, from under this authority, and come into this. The blood of Jesus shed at Calvary has never, never lost its power to cleanse every believer from sin. When we ask God to forgive our sins, the Father can say, you're forgiven. Why can he say that? How can he say that? Because Jesus already paid for it right here. But you have to ask. Are you hearing me today? It just doesn't happen because we're, we're, we're starting to be better. We'll never get there by doing that. It's like in, in, in the Passover, if you remember the, 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 pa the original Passover, and where all these plagues were coming against the Egyptians so that the Pharaoh would release the Hebrews. And one of them, all the firstborn were dying, judgment was coming on the Egyptians. And God told the, the Hebrews, I want you to take the blood of the sacrificed lamb and I want you to put it on your doorpost for when the death angel sees the blood, it will pass over you. They had to take the blood and apply it. When we ask Jesus to forgive our sins, we are applying the blood. Are you hearing me today? The blood is being applied to our situation, our life. Jesus paid the debt of our sins. The blood of Jesus, why, listen to me, the blood, the blood of Jesus washes away our past and opens up our future. Thank God. When we're water baptized, and this is also in, in that illustration that, that Paul was using here, when we're water baptized, it pictures the fact that the, the moment we put our trust in Jesus, we were washed from the filth of sin and the barrier between God and us is broken. We go into the, it, we're picturing going into the water a sinful person, but we're picturing coming out of the water one who has been washed and cleansed and received by God. What can wash away my sins? What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We've been washed. We're not what we used to be. I, I, I shared in the first service, I, at this time of the year, I'm, I'm out working in my yard and I'm working in my garden and it's so hot and so humid. And it, sometimes I get to the point where I'm just drenched. You know, like I can't stand myself. <laughs> and I come in and get a shower. And I, I started out as like, uh, you know, and then I get a shower. And I come out, I feel like a new man. Well, we've been washed by the blood and we've been made new. Praise God. Praise God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. Listen, I, I may not be 
all I'm going to be, but I'm definitely not what I used to be. Turn to the person next to you right now and say, I've been washed. If we can just grasp the power of what we just said. I've been washed. Do you realize that the, what's in those words, I've been washed? It's the blood. The blood of Jesus has washed us. Taken care of all the sin. Praise God. It says also in 1 Corinthians 6, 11, you were sanctified. You were sanctified. Now in a casual Bible reading, you just zip right past that. Any of us might. But we need to understand, these are important doctrines here. Washed, sanctified. What does sanctify mean? Glad you asked. First, it means to set apart people and things for the service of God. To take something and say, this I'm about to use. This is what God does when he sanctifies us. He takes us from what we used to be and says, okay, I've got plans for you. Jeremiah 29, 11, Most of us know that scripture. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. In other words, I sanctify you. Plans for your welfare, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. God has plans for us. Don't ever say, I, I, you know, I'm, I have no value. You have value. Don't ever say, I have no purpose. You have purpose. God has plans for you. When he took you out of that kingdom and brought you into his kingdom, he says, I have plans for you. Plan you will see what you never thought you will see. You will do what you never dreamed of doing. You will have what you never thought you would have. Because I have plans for you. The second part of, of sanctify is this. It's the process of sanctify. See, God takes us as we are. He sees our potential. And he begins a, pro a process of changing us into the image of Christ. No other words, I, I, I may go, um, uh, often use gardening because I, I love gardening. Uh, I may be doing something in my garden. I have to go get a certain tool. I get a tool I haven't used since last year. I look at it, and yes, it's the exact tool, and I want to use this one, and it will do what I need to do. But it's a little dirty. And I have to knock the dirt off of it. I have to clean it up a little bit and get it ready so I can use it now. Well, that's what, that's what happens often with us. God takes it and says, oh, that's, you're perfect. All you've been through, I don't waste anything. The good, the bad, and the ugly, it's all there. I'm going to use it for good. You're going to be able to minister to people no one else can minister to because no one has lived through what you have lived through. And God says, but to use you even more, I need to clean you up a little more. So I'm working on you. Some things, the moment we step from this kingdom into this kingdom, some things change immediately. How many ever had that happen? I mean, an instant change. Other things, it's a process. It may be a short time or a long time, but it's a process. So we can say, I am sanctified and I am being sanctified. I am set apart for God, but I am also in the process of being changed to be more useful to my God. Hallelujah. Some of you have seen over in the area that we're, we're redoing, that part of the church building, you, you've seen a sign that looks like this. Pardon our appearance, we're under construction. I think all of us need to have a sign. <laughs> I'm not all I'm going to be, but I'm definitely not what I used to be. Pardon the fact that in some areas I need a little work yet. Show me a little grace, a little mercy, as I will show you the same thing. Because you need it more than I do. No, no. <laughs> just, just a joke. So the nature of, of sanctification is twofold. First of all, Christians have been made holy through their union with God. They... Just the fact that God has accepted you. He's a holy God. And, and you're accepted in Christ. The Father now sees you in Christ. So when he sees you, he sees what Jesus has done. Not what you have done. 
So the Father treats us as holy because we've been washed by the blood of the Holy Lamb of God. It's been applied. I'll, I'll go into more of that later. The second part of sanctification is, is that process. We continue to grow and, and to strive for holiness. We need to, we need to be cooperating with the Holy Spirit because he is, he is changing us step by step. Don't go like, I'm not going any further than this. No, we should be constantly changing and saying, Holy Spirit, change me. Change me today so I'm not like I was yesterday. It's the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit who dwells within you, who is working on you. So right now, I want you to turn to the person next to you and say, I am sanctified. Now tell them, I'm being sanctified. See, it's a process. It's a both a present situation, positional, and a process. <clears throat> In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, it also says, you were justified. What does that mean? The, the term is justification. The doctoral term is justification. Here's what it means. It means to pronounce acquitted, not pardoned, acquitted, and free from guilt and shame. It means to be declared by God to be righteous. But we have an attitude of, well, no, I, you know, I've done this, I've done that, you know, and I've grown up with the whole process of if I do something wrong, get punished for it. Uh, back when I was a kid, when I made my parents mad, I had to be extra good for a while just to get them to smile at me again. <clears throat> takes time. But God says it doesn't work like that. When I receive you, when you ask for forgiveness, it's not a process, well, I'll forgive you slowly. It's not a process of, well, you know, I originally had you at a 10, but you've slipped and I'm only going to bring you back to a 5. No, God says, I put you back at the 10 level. Justification is Jesus, the Father says, Jesus already paid for your sins. So now I look at you the way I look at my son Jesus. In right standing with me. And because you're in right standing with me, every promise that I have offered you is yours. It's yes and amen to you. You don't have to work at it. You don't have to say, but oh, if I could just be like so and so, and they, you know, miracles happen with them. No, God says, the moment you ask for forgiveness, I make you righteous or right standing in my sight. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 5.21 says that. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin. That's why his blood was so valuable. So that we could be made right with God through Christ. That's how we're made right with God. Oh, it's not like, oh, I just got to work harder. I got to be better. God says, no, if you trust in my son and the work of the cross, I receive you and I look at you the way I look at Christ, the son of God. And because of that, look at this scripture. We sang it today. Romans 8, 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Why no condemnation? Because in our minds we go like, oh, I'm no good, I'm this, I did that, I did that. God says no, therefore. Therefore why? What's the therefore? Because of what Jesus did on the cross and your acceptance of that and your receiving of that. Therefore now there's no condemnation. Yeah, but they're condemning me. The, I'm not condemning you, says the Lord. I'm the one that matters, not them. Yes, yes but in my mind, I, I, you know, I beat myself up and I just say, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy. God says, shut up. There is now, therefore, no condemnation. I am highly favored. 
Now let me go back to a word that I touched on earlier to explain it. Galatians 5.21 said that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Let's explain what practice means. In the original Greek, the word is prezo, and it means what one does repeatedly, continually, habitually, doing something with no sincere desire or effort to change. It also means continuing without repentance, resisting the convicting work of the Holy Spirit, Knowing that, and it says those who practice those things. In other words, those who say, yes, you know, I, I, whatever sin you can think of right now, yes, I do that. Well, do you want to stop? No, I don't want to stop. Should you do it? No, I know I shouldn't do it, but I'm, I'm not going to stop. Do, do you want to repent of it? Do you want to turn around and do something? No, I, I'm, I'm good with what I am. That person who says, hey, you need to recognize me for who I am. I'm just sinful, and if you don't like it, that's tough. That person is not repentant. That person doesn't want to change. And that's what's saying those who do that repeatedly, habitually, with no desire to change, and resisting the fact that the Holy Spirit is saying, please, please don't do that. Do, go this way. Turn from that. And we're going like, no, Holy Spirit, I don't, I don't even believe in you, so forget you. That person will not inherit the kingdom of God. But if someone says, the Holy Spirit has been working on me and I feel like something's wrong. Something's missing. I, 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 I'm beginning to hate that. I, I don't know what to do about it. God says, yeah, that's the first step. Now, if you receive the fact that I paid for those sins, apply the blood. You can walk right over into the kingdom of God. I will bring you in and all my blessings are yours for now and all eternity and you will be with me forever. So there's the, the uniqueness, the, the importance of the word practice. So in other words, you may say, but, but I, I used to do that and, 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 I, and I fell back and I, and, and I did it again or I do those things, or whatever it may be. I have that attitude again. What do you do about that? You may have said, I've tried. I, I, I really worked on it, and, and this is what I keep falling to. And you may be here today. And you may be online. You say, yeah, there are certain things that it just, it's, it's my weak area, and I, and I know it's wrong, but I keep falling, and... And, and, and I try, well, the problem is you, that's the problem. You've been trying. You alone have been trying. In that area of Scripture, let's look at it again, 1 Corinthians 6, 11. So some of you were, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified. Now look at this, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. First of all, when the Holy Spirit worked on you before you got saved, there came a point where you were saying, ah, something's missing. And you began to search for something and you didn't know what you were searching for. And then it says, the power of God, the the, the the Spirit of our God. That's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was convicting you of the way you were living, of your lack of God in your life. And as you were searching, the Holy Spirit set it up so that you were, you were watching TV one day and somebody was preaching and you heard and you, you said yes. Or maybe you were reading the Bible, just, well, I'll give the Bible a try. A try like me, and you're reading the Bible and the Holy Spirit said, that's you. And you came to Jesus. Or you're a Christian already and you've fallen in a certain area or 
just it keeps coming back up. It's part of your old nature that keeps coming back up. And you say, but I, I, I keep trying. This scripture talks about in the spirit of our God. That means the Holy Spirit. Here's the difference. I want to show you a scripture that is so vital. And again, if you're struggling with any area of life, in fact, if I, if I asked the show of hands of who's struggling with something in their life, you'd all raise your hands because that's the way we are. But here's the key to the victory. And it's found in that, in that scripture where it talks about in the spirit of our God. Look at Romans 8.13. For if you live according to your old nature, those things that were back in there, that keep pulling you back, if you live by that, you will certainly die. You may die earlier physically than you would have, should have. Also means you would die, you could possibly die spiritually and be separated from God. But then it says, but if, everybody say if. Oh, this is a great if. If by the Spirit, by the Holy Spirit, you keep, everybody say keep, you keep putting to death the practices of the body, you will live. And since when you came to Jesus, the Holy Spirit entered you, you have power there that we often don't utilize when we're trying to break free of this thing, which is kind of a leftover from that. We keep trying hard, oh, I'll just try harder, but I'm not succeeding, so I'll just get to the fact that I live with it. No, God says, no, I'm still sanctifying you. I'm changing you. The Holy Spirit is still working on you. And you need, by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells within, to overcome that thing by putting it to death. And it doesn't just say put to death like one time. It's like oftentimes this thing will come back and you go, I'm killing you again. <laughs> and again. Amen. And again. Yeah. Until finally it doesn't resurrect again. See, the Holy Spirit convicts us of our sin and then gives us the power to overcome it. Praise God. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See, we go from unrighteous to righteous. And the moment we go to righteous, all the power, all the promises are yes and amen to us. So let's put this together. I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian for X number of years, months, days, years, whatever it may, decades. And most of me has changed. I'm not like what I was. But there's some areas that I haven't overcome yet. God says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful and just to say, my son paid for that. So I forgive you. But you don't stop there. You say, Holy Spirit, help me. I'm forgiven. I got the promises of God. I'm, I'm in, in perfect fellowship with God again. Holy Spirit, help me. Holy Spirit says, I've been waiting for you to ask. Because I've been here going like, hello. <laughs> Believe me, the moment you say, Holy Spirit, help me, it changes everything. Because the power, the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead dwells in you and will quicken your mortal body, will enable your mortal body to overcome that which has beset you for so long. And you keep doing that until that thing is dead, dead. <laughs> so we're washed, we're sanctified, and we're justified. And that scripture in 1 Corinthians says you were, which means they are. So you were, therefore you are. Washed, justified, sanctified. You were those, you, all those things have happened to you. You are no longer defined by your sin. We have to see ourselves the way God sees us. Washed, 
sanctified, justified. Would you all stand with me, please? Listen, if you're here today or online, if you have not been washed, sanctified, justified, there's no time better than the present. You can do that. You can do that here. Will everyone just bow your head with me, please? I want, just, I want you to, just to be thinking, everybody here, washed, sanctified, justified. If you're here and those things have not happened to you right now, in order to have them happen, I want you to do this. I want you to call out to Jesus right now. Just say, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Tell Jesus, I, I, I know you're the Son of God. That you died for my sins. And you were raised on the third day. I receive, Jesus, your salvation. And I declare over myself, Jesus Christ is Lord. If you prayed that prayer for the first time, welcome to the family of God. Whether you're here or online, welcome. It's that simple. If you're here today, I want you to just think about this. Paul admonished these people because they've been slipping back into some old ways. If that's, if that's anyone here, and you're fighting with certain issues <clears throat> that have so easily beset you, just say to Jesus right now, forgive me. Forgive me. Now say, Holy Spirit, help me. Help me. And right now the Holy Spirit is saying, thank you. I've been waiting for your request. You have just received the truth, and the truth has set you free. I want you to just stay in the presence of the Lord. I want you to enter into a song that Brandon has written, inspired by this very message. So let us do that now.
I am washed. I am sanctified. I am justified. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, let's celebrate. If anybody would like prayer, Someone to stand with you, confirm some of the things that happened to you today. I want you to come on up. There's people who will pray with you. For the rest of us, I want just keep in mind, washed, sanctified, justified. Don't let those doctrinal points slip your mind. When the enemy wants to come in, you go, no, I am washed. I'm sanctified. And I'm justified. And there's no condemnation. I am free. I am free. Somebody here needs to say that to yourself right now. I am free. Because until you say it, you don't have the breakthrough. Right now, I am free. Father, we leave this place having been washed by your word. We leave this place with a greater love for you, O oh God. For what was done so that we might leave one kingdom and be brought into your kingdom. Thank you, Lord, for the plan of salvation. Jesus, thank you for the crucifixion. Thank you for the blood that was shed. Holy Spirit, thank you for convicting us and leading us to Jesus and working in us to be more like him every day. We honor you, Lord God. We praise you. We thank you for your work in us and through us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. God bless you all.